Good afternoon, Namaskar. I, Kriti Vadhera, would like to welcome all the teachers, learners, educators, students to CIT and CRT's live phone in program. And you are watching us live on PME with us channel number 9. This session will be for standard 9 students. English is the subject which we will be dealing up in this uh, particular uh, session. And the expert who joined us today for this session, I would like to introduce Dr. Amit Ranjan from CIT and CRT. We welcome you to PME with there. Thank you so much. Thanks. And before we start with today's interaction, I would like to remind you here that if you have any queries, any questions and suggestions, then do let us know. You can dial on our toll-free number. Number would be double eight double zero double four zero double five nine. And you can also watch the live streaming of this program happening on our official YouTube channel NCRT official. And there is one more medium through which you can contact us. You can mail your questions and suggestions on dth.class9 at the ciet.nic.in. So let's begin with today's live interaction for Standard 9 students. I welcome you again, Dr. Ranjan. So what are we going to discuss today in this particular so session? Today we are going to discuss um, for Class 9 uh, from the book Beehive, this poem called On Killing a Tree by Give Patel. Okay. Um, this is a poem from 1966. So let's um, quickly have a look at the poem, then we'll go line by line, understand its meaning, then have a discussion about the poem. Right? Right. So On Killing a Tree <coughs> by Give Patel here on your screen. Um, this is from poems published by Nisim Ezekiel uh, in 1966. It takes much time to kill a tree. Not a simple jab of knife will do it. It has grown slowly, consuming the earth, rising out of it, feeding upon its crust, absorbing years of sunlight, air, water, and out of its leprous hide, sprouting leaves. So hack and chop. But this alone won't do it. Not so much pain will do it. The bleeding bark will heal and from close to ground will rise curled green twigs, miniature boughs, which if unchecked will expand again to form a size. No, the root is to be pulled out, out of the anchoring earth, it is to be roped, tied and pulled out, snapped out or pulled out entirely. Out from the earth cave and the strength of the tree exposed, the source white and wet, the most sensitive, hidden for years inside the earth. Then the matter of scorching and choking and sun and air, browning, hardening, twisting, withering, and then it's done. So that is the poem. And um, it's, it's an amazing poem, uh, way, written way before the time that we have grown environmentally conscious, some 55 years ago. So there have always been artists who have been concerned about ecological degradation and, and things like that. So let's look at the poem line by line again um, to um, get its meaning and then we'll discuss the themes. <coughs> it takes much time to kill a tree. I've separated this line from the rest because there is a clear break in the poem itself. And this is what the poem is going to explore. This is the statement, let's say, of the poem that a tree cannot be killed just like that. It takes a lot of time to, to kill a tree. Not a simple of jab of knife will do it. So like you can kill a human being with a simple jab of knife, that cannot happen uh, with a tree. Because as they say, what, what grows suddenly also falls suddenly, what takes time to build um, also withers away slowly. And so a tree grows consuming the earth, rising out of it, feeding upon its crust. So, so a tree <coughs> uh, combines a lot of things, it takes elements from the soil, it takes water, it takes carbon dioxide, um, photosynthesizes its, its own food and therefore it, it's, there's a lot of effort that's gone into the synthesis of the material that's produced by the tree and, and so it cannot be undone as easily as a human life can be undone. Rising out of it, feeding upon its crust, absorbing years of sunlight, air, water out of its leprous hide. Here um, leprous hide is skin. And leprous is because it looks like a tree is leprosy stricken. The bark on a tree is, is thick and rough, um, <coughs> sprouting leaves. So the first stanza tells us that it's, it's taken years and years of, of effort and synthesis um, of combining various elements of earth to make a tree. And so it's not easy to kill, kill it. That's the first stanza. In the second stanza, 
So hack and chop, but this alone won't do it. And so humans in their vanity may think that they can hack and chop a tree, but this alone won't kill the tree. Not so much pain will do it. The bleeding bark will heal. And even though you're giving so much pain to the tree, it is not going to kill it instantly. The bleeding bark will heal. The bark, the skin, uh, which is bleeding by the cut, it will heal again right. through the forces of nature and through the tree's own will. So there's a term that the philosopher Schopenhauer uses, which is um, the will on which the whole world operates. And so we think of the world as operating randomly through a series of accidents, etc. But Schopenhauer says that it is through the will of the world that it lives on. So we all have an inherent will to live. And so the bleeding bark will heal, uh, heal and from close to the ground will rise curled green twigs. So you've cut a big tree. And then you will suddenly notice that at its base, the small leaves that spring up again. Despite that damage to years of, let's say a tree has grown for 100 years, you cut its main um, stem and despite that, um, despite that cut, despite that wound, it will reheal and start growing leaves. Uh, miniature boughs, uh, small twigs, small stems will, if unchecked, expand again and you leave it. Like you see, um, the people trees grow on walls. They grow from nowhere. Nobody puts those seeds in, in walls, but right. they, start, they start growing and you leave them unchecked. It breaks the walls, it breaks entire buildings to its former size. So even if you cut that tree, it has the capability. And so the first stanza tells that it's not easy to kill a tree. The second stanza says that the wounds that we think um, undo uh, human beings or the uh, undo our lives are not the kind of wounds that can damage trees to that extent. The third stanza, no, so if a simple jab of knife or even if cutting the branch, cutting the main trunk does not kill the tree, what is to be done? So it's like a manual how to kill a tree, no. The root is to be pulled out, out of the anchoring earth, it is to be roped tight. So after you've cut the main trunk, the tree still doesn't die. So what do you do? Then you bring a crane and anchor it and pull the whole thing out, uh, <clears throat> the, the roots out. So it's like an iceberg, like it's said about an iceberg that it's one ninth of it that's above the surface and eight parts of it are below the surface. Below the surface. And similarly, a tree is more under the surface. <clears throat> it is to be rope tied and pulled out, snapped out or pulled out entirely out from the earth cave and the strength of the tree exposed, that is the strength, the roots are the strength, the most sensitive, hidden for years inside the earth. And roots are the strength, but also the most sensitive part, is the moment you expose them um, to air, you take them out of their habitat, they'll wither away uh, very quickly. And so that is the way to kill the tree. <clears throat> and then, the matter of scorching and choking in sun and air, browning, hardening, twisting, withering, and then it's done. So the roots then are scorched by the heat, they are choked because they're not getting uh, water, they're not getting air in the way they're used to um, in their environment. Um, and, and so once it is exposed to sun and air, then the roots brown and, and they harden and then they wither away and that is the way to kill a tree. So it's very interesting. <coughs> um, how Giv Patel has dealt with the matter of killing a tree. So it's almost a manual about killing a tree. So what do you think about it? Um, it it's like he's telling people who, uh, de who carry out deforestation that it's not so easy to carry it out. There's a different way to do it. You have to pull a tree out of its root. And so there is a parallel strain of thought in this poem um, it, it runs on an ecological level about preservation of trees by telling how to kill, kill a tree. So it works with an inverse logic. By telling that the methods to kill a tree, he is trying to preserve the idea of protecting the tree. Right. One. And secondly, the, this entire tree poem is a metaphor to human life. So we see otherwise that generally, let's look at the themes where uh, we will talk about this. So first point is eco-criticism. So we, 
uh, criticism is a way to analyze a text. It's, it's not criticism, friends, in a, in a simple sense of criticizing something, but um, as, as you would study more um, in social sciences, you would see that criticism is a way to analyze um, <coughs> a text, a situation and <coughs> to present a critique. So, there are various ways to study a text through um, um, the moral of the text, let us say, or through the situation of gender in a text, <coughs> etc. And there is also a way of seeing a text through eco criticism, which is seeing it through ecology and concerns around ecology. And so, this is a growing field because most of the texts, most of the stories and poems are written about human beings and not about the flora and fauna. Uh, <coughs> The trees and the animals in the uh, our natural context, they are not written around that. So, there is an increasing awareness of integrating these elements as well into our writing. That the world merely does not belong to human beings, but to others as well. Treeification of human beings. This is an interesting term that I have introduced over here. Generally, it is personification. personification in the yes. next poem, we will see how a tree is compared to a human being. But here a human being is compared to a tree. Okay. So, this poem is as much about human resilience as it is about tree. So, there are various kinds of movements that have happened in the world um, to, to, uh, to fight for justice, to fight for certain causes and uh, uh, this message goes out from the poet to those struggling constituencies as well. Now, let us look at examples. There is the feminist movement, so women did not have the vote to write in India, they had uh, the right to vote, sorry. In India, they had from 1947, but in many European countries in America, it took hundreds of years of struggle to get there. And so, <clears throat> that women constitute 50 percent of the population and, and that they are intrinsic uh, uh, to the human workforce and that they were denied their rights. So, taking the logic of this poem, you, you cannot kill an aspiration of people just like that. You have to uproot it. And so, that is how, this is a message of Giv Patel that goes out from the uh, nature to all kinds of situations. There is the Afro-American movement, the black movement in America, which was led by Martin Luther King Jr., um, where <clears throat> one lady was not allowed to sit in a bus on a white person's seat and this was as late as 1963. And then there was a mass movement uh, because following the same logic, the aspirations of people, the fight for equal rights cannot be suppressed just like that. Now, that is one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is also the regressive values in a society do not go away equally. So, like there are fruit bearing trees, there is also weeds um, in our ecosystem as well. And they also require similar effort. Uh, to get uprooted critique. For example, there was this um, French revolution in, in 1968 in which students and workers uh, participated and uh, uh, for fighting for their rights, etc. And eventually, uh, lots of their demands were fulfilled. But what happened is Julia Kristeva, famous uh, feminist of that time, she got disillusioned because she thought that various professors and various other key players of the uh, revolution did not take part. And so, she thought that there is something intrinsic in European languages which makes this impossible. That languages themselves are patriarchal. So, French patriarchal means something that is male dominated, that our society is male dominated, the systems are male dominated. And so, it would be difficult for women to rise in to such a To be in the decision making or yeah, exactly, and which is what uh, is, is called the glass ceiling in, in, in gender parlance that yeah. that that the the management would give excuses to a woman that you have a child, so you cannot go to America, you cannot become the president of of this particular company, etc. And so Julia Kristeva thought, and if you think the basic bottom line is the um, bad words, the abuses in any language, if you analyze them they are all directed against women. They are kinship terms which are directed against women directly. And so, Julia Kristeva said that uh, there is something bad in the European languages itself. So, she went to China, that some Eastern language where she will be able to discover 
a true feminist trained how to write, where also it failed for her. But what I am trying to say that there are two ways to look at this, uh, the idea of on killing a tree in human life is one is the human resilience, the aspiration for justice, for equal rights, etc. And the other is also the regressive things in the system. They also won't go away as easily um, as, as we think. It, it takes years of struggle to, to get that weed out as well. So it works both ways. And so this poem is very important on all the fronts to understand how important the trees are to us, how, how there is a natural formulation around us which has taken millions of years to build and we are destroying that ecosystem. So we have already run out of natural resources like coal and petroleum, we are looking at alternate energy resources. So we have played and we are talking of climate change and, and the ozone hole and all of that. And this is because we have we've played with the environment in the name of development so much that this uh, we have reached on the brink of, of this. So Giv Patel is very far sighted in seeing this as far back as 1966. 66, yeah. On the other hand, instead of personification, he turns it around and shows what is to be learned from trees in human life, how it takes years and centuries for a culture to build and how uh, uh, its ethos, its aspirations, the aspiration for equality and justice have to be preserved and so on. And so it's, it's a very beautiful poem that works around these themes and that is the beauty of poetry, it's, it's condensed form that is able to address several constituencies and several ideas um, uh, together. Right, so now let us also look at the form in this poem. It's free verse, it does not rhyme very often as you can see. And uh, the last time um, <coughs> we saw, uh, if you remember in Duck and the Kangaroo, the idea of enjambments. Enjambments, which yeah, is I remember. One line runs into the other. So, for example. So, here also we can <coughs> see this? Um, I mean, uh, yes, does this poem also giving example of example? Absolutely. So, example, okay. let's, look, let's look at this paragraph. So, hack and chop, but this alone won't do it. So, the first line runs into the second line. Hack and chop, but this alone. Not so much pain will do it. The bleeding bark will heal and from close ground. So, and is a continuation of the idea from the previous line. Right. Um, and, and there's, though it's not a rhymed poem, there's an intrinsic poetic rhythm within this, uh, uh, within this, there's an internal rhythm uh, within this poem if you uh, read it. Now there's a companion poem to this uh, poem in the same chapter which is by Joyce Kilmer, let's quickly have a look at it and it's very interesting to, uh, to contrast these two poems um, because we saw that in Guy Patel's poems there's treeification of human beings and here the tree is being personified and this poem is also about trees. So let us have a look at this, uh, this, this poem called Trees by Joyce Kilmer. It's a poem from 1914. I think I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. So he calls the tree a poem. So that's a very poetic beginning to not just compare a tree with a human being but with poetry itself. And a tree of course is very poetic in the way it grows the way flowers face the sun, for example, sunflower or the way they curl up on touch and all kinds of things. So of course, there is endless poetry in nature and endless poetry in, in trees. True. I think I shall never see a poem as lovely as a tree. A tree whose hungry mouth is pressed against the earth's sweet flowing breast. And so, here he is personifying the tree as a human being whose mouth is pressed upon the earth's breast. So, earth is the mother, mother from, nature, yeah. from which the child tree is having its milk. A tree that looks at God all day, <coughs> excuse me, a tree that looks at God all day and lifts her leafy arms to pray. So, it is like a human being in prayer, the tree looking towards the sky all day and the branches reach out to the heaven, um, <coughs> which is of course because a tree has to grow its branches to get enough sunlight to photosynthesize, to form its own food, but this is the way the poet looks at it, that a tree is like a human being, being with outstretched arms, looking out, calling out to God all day. So there is nothing more um, <coughs> devoted than a tree uh, to, to, to God's will, let us say. A tree that may in summer wear a nest of robins in her hair. So now here the poet is comparing the tree 
to a to a girl um, um, who wears several things in her buns and so the tree in in her bun and look at how the tree has been shown as a female throughout and which is also important all the gender aspects that we've been talking about and so instead of uh, the flowers there there are robins the the birds which are in her hair upon whose bosom slow has lain who intimately lives with rain and so the tree also suffers or enjoys the snowfall here uh, it's in the sense of enjoyment and who also intimately lives with the rain and so the tree which stands summer rain and winter poems are made by fools like me but only a god can make a tree and so eventually he ends it with um, uh, that poems can be made by human beings so words can be words or signification of language can be achieved by human beings but human beings cannot make trees trees have to be made uh, by 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 some divine force okay so here let's quickly look look um, at at the uh, form and compare it we saw that there's personification of the tree over here the tree is personified instead of um, quite in contrast with gib patel's poet where human beings have to become like the tree right. and it's also rhymed a rhymed poet uh, poem unlike uh, gib patel's uh, this is from 1914 so let's also quickly look at uh, both the poets in a couple of minutes gib patel born 1940 um, he is a famous uh, poet he is also a physician yeah. a, a, a doctor we can have a look on the screen our viewers can have a look on the yeah so this is gib patel he is he is a doctor he is a poet he is also an artist and most of his uh, poetry has been associated with um, um, the relationship between his land owning family and the tribals who worked on their estate who do wali paintings he is an avant garde artist um, avant garde is a is a french term which was used for art for art sake so he is a part of that movement called avant garde art <coughs> and um, joy skilma the other poem that we saw 1886 to 1918 as you can see he died very young just at 22 years is an american um who wrote trees and other poems so primarily this poem that we saw the trees is what he is uh, famous from uh, for and this is from 1914 just around the first world war um he was a journalist editor and literary critic um so that was uh, a discussion on uh, these two poems on killing a tree and trees by joyce kilner and you can see uh, kriti that um one is from 1914 and one is from 1966 66. so even a whole century ago and half a century ago there was a discussion going around about how ecological to, disbalances i would say absolutely and also to incorporate these matters into art and literature and painting right. and bring it into a mainstream sort of a discussion which has become so important now and uh, uh, so <clears throat> i would advise um, my friends and learners to look up more literature that is around uh, uh, nature and trees and also how it relates with human life and what is the sort of uh, message that is given to um, human beings as well through these ecological poems is something that must be looked at um it is so mesmerizing to witness the way you explain the way you read the poems it was really wonderful to have Thank you, you so today much. for today's session as well dr ranjan and so i really hope that further also you will be uh, enlightening our 9th standard and 10th uh, standard students it's, with it's your no enlightening is just a discussion that no, we the, the all the way you of. explain it uh, even i learn a lot about uh, from your sessions so it is really wonderful uh, Thank you. to have you for these two poems today and i guess our learners have also understood a lot uh, and they've gained a lot uh, out of today's sessions and uh, here i would like to request you that remain connected to pme vidya because in next webinar we will be discussing about ict tool remain connected thank you namaskar